So I want to greet you and welcome you this morning in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I trust you're going to be blessed as you listen to the word this morning. How many of you are ready to listen to uh, the conclusion of Throw Him Overboard? Are you ready? Amen. How many of you have learned something over the last few weeks? So we talked about beneath the calm. We've spoken about on dry ground. And we talked about in 40 days, and I believe that many people at the moment are fasting and praying, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Last week, we dealt with the subject, is it right? This is the question that God asked Jonah. And he said to him, is it right? And you know, the strange thing is, and many of us do this, and I told you last week, it's sad when God starts to question your life that you decide to move out instead of responding. Amen. But this morning, I want to close with what I have entitled, Steady, Steady On. Steady, Steady On. And this phrase I first learned when I spent time in the UK a few years ago, when Darissa and I were living there, it's a very popular way of telling you to calm down. It's a sophisticated way of saying, Take a chill pill. So turn to your neighbor and say, steady, steady on. Calm down. I know there's many things happening. I know there's a lot happening, but steady. Are you ready to steady yourself this morning? Because a lot of the times you become unsteady as God is doing th- stuff in your life. How many of you know that? Many times you actually destabilize a move of God for your life because you cannot be steady. The Bible says, having done all, stand, be steady. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verses 6 through to 11 is what we're looking at. And this is the final chapter, and these are the final few verses. Verse number 6 says, And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day, God prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vermint east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry even to death. And the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and much livestock. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Steady, steady on. The Bible says, after Jonah had moved out, he now finds himself at the east side of the city, outside of the city, but he can look in. And the Bible says he built himself a shelter. Okay? He's built himself a shelter. The Bible now says in verse number 6, God prepared a plant. I need you to know, for every moment of disobedience that you are currently thinking about, every decision that leads you into a place of disobedience, God is preparing a plant. God is preparing a 
plant. I want to remind you, God did not start preparing the plant when he told Jonah to go to Nineveh. He prepared a fish when Jonah disobeyed God the first time. Do you know that disobedience, if you're not careful, can become a lifestyle? It can become a pattern. Jonah, who was rescued from the fish by God, is now disobedient again. You know, people are saying, God, do it again. I see a people of God that are rising that are disobedient again. The Bible says, God prepared a plant and he made it come over Jonah. The old King James Version, the authorized King James Version, calls that plant a gold. It says gold. And if you do a bit of research, you'll find that a gold is a creeper. So it cannot grow upright unless it creeps. It creeps onto what already exists. My God, help me. A gold is a creeper. It will grow onto what already exists. Let me remind you, verse number 6 said that Jonah built a shelter. Where do you think the plant's growing? It's growing on top of what Jonah has already built. Sometimes you think God is on your side because he's busy working with what you already established. Ha ha ha. But let me make sure you understand. My God knows how to set you up. The Bible says God's whole purpose for this plant is to what? To come over Jonah that it might be shade for his head and to deliver him from his misery. Ha! I love the word of God. I just love the word of God. And again, I want to remind you that this is an anointed vessel of God. So your anointing is not in question. Your call is not in question. This man is called of God. And your ability to deliver deliverance into other people's lives is not what is called into question. Because you are confused because you are Jonah and stuff happens because you show up. But here we have, the Bible says, God's now allowing this plant to creep over the shelter that Jonah has built that he's now sitting inside of. And let me just remind you, why is he sitting there? What does verse number 5 say? He wants to see others fail. So he pulls out to peer in and watch you fall. And he thinks God is on his side because he built a shelter and the shelter was not good enough to keep out the sun. So God now prepares a plant that will grow on top of the structure. Let me tell you something you think because stuff is growing under your authority, you think that you are okay. I'm talking to all the growers here in the house of God, and I know Harbalites is packed with people that grow. The Bible says, why does God do this? To deliver him from his misery. And the Bible says, so Jonah was grateful. Ah, thank you, Lord. You are finally vindicating me. Thank you, Lord. You are finally showing those people that did those things to me who's the real oh yeah. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Grateful. What's he grateful for? Because God has delivered him from whose misery? I want you to know your misery is your problem. It's personal to you. It's got nothing to do with my anointing. The misery that you're currently experiencing has nothing to do with me. You can go to another church and you'll still be miserable. You can have deliverance occur. You can have the greatest revival break out under your watch and you'll still be miserable. I want you to know anointing does not break the yoke of misery. So the Bible says Jonah was very grateful for the plant. How many of you are grateful for how things are growing in your life? How many of you are grateful? 
No, no, you don't want it. You know why? Because you know what's going to happen. It's coming. That, that thunder from the heaven is coming. You know now. Now you know. Abelites is well aware. We don't judge how God is dealing with your life based on your bank balance. Yet yeah, Abelites. Uh-uh. We don't do that. I know a lot of churches do that, but that, that's, that's the problem with the kingdom right now. We're judging on the car you're driving. We're judging on the house. No, no, no. God can grow what you bought. He can cause expansion in your business, in your life, in your career. But hey, he's about to smack you. The Bible says, verse number seven, but... We've dealt with many buts. We've had a but where God comes and changes your life. We've had, had a but that we've looked at in over months and years where God shows up and he does the miraculous. He raises you out of sickness, out of despair. But hey, God's about to kick you after delivering you from misery. The Bible says, as morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm. Worms are nasty things. And why does God prepare the worm? And it so damaged the plant that it withered. My God, hold on now, hold on. So verse number six says, who prepared the plant? God. And what was the purpose of the plant? To deliver him from his misery. Let me make sure you understand. This is all happening in one night. In one night, God prepared a plant and this thing grew. And it grew, and it grew. And it got to a place where it was lovely now. It's covering him. And he's grateful to deliver him from his misery. As morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm. The next day, morning is coming, right? And God prepared a worm. Same God prepared the plant, now prepares the worm. And what is the purpose of the worm? To damage the deliverance that God has just brought. To trip up the deliverance that God has just brought. To unstick the miracle that God has just performed. To wipe it out. The same God that brings deliverance is the same God that's bringing the damage your way. The Bible tells me the same God that prepared the plant. To deliver him out of wherever he's been. is the same God that now prepares a worm to damage that which he has just miraculously brought into his life. This is why I say to people, I don't care what the miracle is. Every miracle under the sun is temporary. I told you many times, even Lazarus who God raised from the dead. He is dead again. You don't see Lazarus that Jesus said, come forth still walking around the planet at the moment. Every one of the people that Jesus healed in the New Testament, guess what? All dead. So every miracle is temporary. You are worshiping miracle. You're not worshiping God. You worship because you got money now. But when God brings the worm to chow your dollars, ha, hey, my friend, don't curse us. I'm not cursing you. Your attitude is bringing the worm. Your misery that you keep bringing into the house of God is about to bring a worm. The same God that prepared a plant of deliverance prepares a worm of damage. Now, understand why your lives are going the way they are. You might be in the tree growing phase of your life, but understand full well, the worm, she's coming. Oh yeah, you walk around here like you all that, the worm, she's coming. Be careful. That's why I say, the title I've given this message is steady, bro. Steady yourself. My dear, steady yourself. I know God is promoting you and elevating you, but steady yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't think you can come and run the church now because you dropped the biggest offering in this church. Uh-uh. Don't think you have the right to tell me how to preach now. Uh-uh. Steady yourself. Because if you're not careful, 
Just like that. You'll be grateful for the tree. Watch what happens now, right? Let's read. Verse number 8. And it happened. Fasting and praying is not going to change it happening. You see, a whole community fasted and prayed. But it's happening for Jonah. If you're not careful because of your attitude to what God has done for somebody else's life, while they celebrate God delivering them, God brought in a temporary gratitude to put you offside before he smacks you on the back of your head with damage. And it happened when the sun arose. And you know, we used to singing that song, Hey, joy comes in. Lord, then tomorrow is going to be a good day. Tomorrow is going to be a better day. Let me remind you, he is in a place of misery. The Bible tells us God prepared the plan to do what? Deliver him from misery, right? So he's a miserable guy right now. And I'm sure he knows the Bible and he knows that the Bible says, oh, morning endures the night. But your joy is going to come in the morning. Some of you waiting for tomorrow, you better be careful. It'll be better if you stay in bed tomorrow. Because the Bible says, when the sun arose, God is not done. Now he prepares a vehement east wind. Okay, so one plant he prepared. One thing went well. But I'm, a t- I'm telling you, child of God, if you're not careful, it's going to hit you one after the other. The worm came, the worm's not enough. Now he's sending the east wind. And let me tell you, where is he positioned? He's positioned on the east side. I want you to understand something. You think you can get away from where God's going to catch you? God will put the wind where you are. So the Bible says he sent the east wind. And not just any east wind. A vehement east wind. And the Bible says he prepared this thing. For every one thing that goes right, when stuff is going wrong, and you start rebuking the devil, you are now fasting. Myron, there's an enemy attacking me, Myron. Come and anoint my business, Myron. Oh, I can't point the oil, but God is after you. God is after you. You cannot be now on your fourth marriage and call me to pour oil. Because you're about to get divorced again. God is after you. The Bible says... God's sending the wind. Hey, now, you know God sent a wind that brought revival last year. How many of you know that? You heard the sound of the wind last year, and that revival has stayed, right? But the same God that sent a wind to bring revival can send a wind, oh my, to damage, destroy. The Bible says, semicolon, and the sun beat on Jonah's head. If he had my type of hairstyle, this all is he's, he's finished now. That's why he built the shelter. Maybe he had my Esther. And then he saw God, hey, Lord, you blessing me, man. But hey, God just set him up. God trapped him. The sun is now beating on Jonah's head. You know, have you ever been in that place where you had a headache, but you don't know, hey, I got a headache. All of a sudden, it's a headache. It's a headache, headache, headache. Everything, a headache. One after headache. Now we're going to the doctor, migraine headache. The doctor reckoned migraine headache. I don't know. God's son is beating your head. Better be careful. It'll pop. You know, we, we pray for all types of growth, right? We pray for God. Uh, let me grow in the things of the Lord. Lord, let me grow. My bank balance must grow. My house must grow. Every, Lord, grow. And wherever I go, it grows. But there's a growth that's coming your way in this season if you're not careful. It's a growth that you don't want. But it's a growth that you deserve because of what you've been doing, bringing misery wherever you go. It's a growth that's coming. And you know the only growth you're about to experience is not in your bank balance. It's not bonus after bonus. It's you're going to grow faint. Imagine growing faint. Get more and more faint. Every time you come to more and more faint. Every time they sing that one song, I get more and more faint. And I think the praise and worship team, there's something wrong. There's nothing wrong with the praise and worship team. There's something wrong with you. Every time Myron starts to preach, as the moment it takes up, I just get faint. I don't know, like a dizzy spell. It's like dizziness. I must go check my blood pressure. I'm, hey, God's growing you faint. 
You like the fainting goat on Bota's hill. God's growing you. Faint. This is the word of God. This is how God finishes this portion of scripture. This is the close to this book called Jonah. The Bible says, then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Now, all of a sudden, there's this ungodly thing. You know, as Christians, we don't wish. We pray. Okay. I've heard people in their moments of despair, when God starts to capsize things, when he starts, first, first it was growth, lovely, we, hey, grateful. One season, one night, imagine this now, right? This is happening one night, he's grateful. As the dawn is coming up, the sun is coming, God sends them worm. And you, you know, I would have loved to have seen that worm. I would have just, imagine this worm, how big this worm is. It ate that whole thing up. Then he's now wishing that he dies. And said, it is better for me to die than to live. Now he's been here before. You'll remember last week he said, take me Lord. Take me now. One moment he's grateful, next moment die. Next moment he's preaching a sermon where everybody is saved. Next moment dead. Next moment, ah, what's going on? Sometimes it's not so much that you have a disorder as you have been disobedient. You've confused disorder and disobedience. Most people in the kingdom of God has got nothing to do with a disorder. It's got to do with disobedience. The Bible says, he wishes he's dead again. Verse number 9, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Hey, God asked him that question last week. And you know what was the result last week when God asked him, is it okay for you to be angry? What happened? He moved out, got, got, he, he got offended, like most people do. Send a letter of resignation to the church, and then they're gone. No, because God asked a question. And so instead of unsettling that disobedient spirit, he moves his whole family and goes to the east side. And he's now on the east side. I want you to know, the question you didn't answer last week, God's going to ask it again. <laughs> the, the question you didn't answer at the other church, God's going to ask you again. The question you refused to answer in your first marriage, you can get to number four now. God's going to ask you again. The, the question you refused to answer when you got the other job and you lost it, God's going to ask you it again. But this time, God's a little bit more sharper with it. Last week, all he said was, is it okay for you to be angry? Is it all right for you to be angry? But this week, he's actually asking him what he's angry about. And this week, I feel God wants to get into what you've been angry about. You see, last week, he just said, why are you angry? You're always angry. What's the story with you? Don't be like that. This week, he wants to ask you specifics. So this week, he says, is it right for you to be angry about the plant. How many of you, all you're angry about is the tree fell over at your house? You know, this morning was an interesting morning. I, I had my cup of coffee, which is delivered to me every morning. You know, it's a, like a miraculous thing. Before I wake up, my coffee is there. I, I wake up to the smell of coffee. So I picked up my coffee, as I always do, and I'm grateful. And then as I drink my coffee, you know what happened? Guess what happened? You think I came to preach to you? I came to preach to me. You know what happened? The handle broke. <laughs> I'm left with the handle in my hand. My coffee is on my bed. From one moment of being grateful. Lord, thank you for the coffee and my lovely wife. It can flip like that. I'm glad I'm not angry about, the, imagine if I was still angry about the coffee, you think I'd be able to preach. I, I, was, I was angry about the coffee, I'm not going to deny it, but I'm, I'm not still there. I went, I said, the devil is a liar. <laughs> then, then God reminded me, what are you preaching this morning? Oh, okay, Lord, sorry, it was you. Okay, what, you sent the worm, it ate the cup? What happened here? Yeah. I said, never mind, Lord, I'm going to go, I'm praying now, I'm going to go make myself another cup of coffee. Praise God. But the Bible says, what happened here? Yeah? You know, you can get angry about stupid things, but God's trying to teach you a lesson that you failed to learn last year. 
You fail to learn it on marriage one or job one. Or, or, or some people, they, they are now professional scholars. So they registered first year architecture. Then architecture didn't work out. Then next year it's land surveyor. Then land surveyor didn't work out. Next year psychiatry. Psychiatry is not working out. So they're professional scholars. It's time you asked yourself, why is it always, like Mario Bellatelli, why always me? Why? Because God is asking you, why are you angry about the plant? I have a feeling this time he's got nowhere to go. Because this time he answers. And he said, it is right for me to be angry. Even to death. And I meet so many Christians that are just like Jonah. Where they refuse to accept correction. Even if God himself, you know, sometimes I can get so upset because I'm thinking, I'm, God, you called me to come talk to this auntie. This auntie is giving me story after story. She don't want to listen. And now she's driving me nuts. I just want to go. But now she's saying this, that, the other, and she's still angry, but she won't change. And you know, I can get upset with that because I'm saying, Lord, but you sent me. And then when I read Jonah, even God speaking himself to you is not enough. Because let me remind you, there's no prophet speaking to Jonah. It's God himself speaking to Jonah. Saying, Jonah, you are the problem. But Jonah wants to make the pastor the problem. Jonah wants to make the leadership the problem. Jonah wants to make the song they sang the problem. Jonah wants to make the fact that the aircon's only on on one side the problem. That's Jonah. Jonah will make everything the problem. But God is saying, and Jonah will even take it to his grave. He says, what does he say? I have a right to be angry even to death. I've been talking to you about stubbornness for a while, Abelites. I've been talking to you about there's a stubborn spirit that has gripped many families in this church. And I have been laboring and fasting and prayer to drive that stubbornness out. I'll tell you why. Because if it isn't driven out, you will go to hell with that spirit. The Bible says this is God speaking to Jonah. How many more things need to happen? First, it was the ship. They lost all their cargo, so he went there. Now he unsettled that old church. That old church started losing. Losing good people. They had so much money, all of a sudden they gone poor. But be careful now, it might be the worm. Don't blame me. Abelites doesn't have that problem, brothers. Abelites, hey, God is just, hey, on top. Th this morning, a pensioner came and told me that I must come pray for a new car, brand new car. Ha. God is, hey, ha. you don't know, but watch out for the worm. So what does the Bible say? He says to God. How many times have people answered me? Yeah, I have a right to be angry with that brother. I have a right to be angry with that sister. Myron, you don't know they took my parking spot. That's been my parking spot from the time Lazarus Israel founded this church. Even when there was Daga there, I used to go park there with my wheelbarrow because I didn't have a car then. I used to leave my slippers there. I said, this is one day when I got my car, I prophesy over the slippers. You're going to tell, hey! You want to argue about parking spots. You pretend like you never got up from the wrong side of the bed. You pretend like your handle never broke while you were drinking coffee ever in your life. If it ever happened, first time it happened to me this morning, let me tell you, it will happen. I, the cup wasn't cracked. Oh, I'm left to the handle, Lord. It is right for me to be even to death. The worst thing is, your anger, you are passing it on to generations. So your sons are just as stubborn as you were. You know, when it came to the church, people said, we got a right to take you to God. I said, take your rights and go. Are you listening, Arbalites? Are you listening? People said, we got a right to fight. What right you got to fight for the church? The church is God's. But you're still here, still sitting in my shade. Some of you thought you will one. The worm's coming to wipe out the shade. Be careful, Abelites. Be careful. I came to speak a word that's going to shift you like Nineveh. 
You see, one of the biggest problems we have is Nineveh can change, but the people that preach the word can't. The people that know the word can't. How, how, how can we get to a place where a whole city can repent, but the man of God can't? Because you're so anointed. It is right for me to be angry, even to death. You know, the last time, he ran away. The Bible says when God asked him the question, why are you angry? He ran away. This time, he responds. I want to caution every child of a living God in this church. Be careful. I think sometimes it's better to run away than to answer arrogantly to God. It is better for you to dig a hole and put your head in it like an ostrich and pretend like nobody else can see you. The Bible says, he now speaks to God, says, I have a right. Verse number 10, but the Lord said, you have pity on a plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Ha, how's that? So, as it was dawning, before it became daylight, God wiped out the plant. How's that? So he never got the benefit of the shade in the sun. Some of you, you all are celebrating in the dark hours of your life. Watch it. And God says to Jonah, you weren't sorry about Nineveh, is what he's trying to say. But you are now upset again about now even a plant. Do you know a person that is continuously looking for reasons to be upset. Everything. First it was Nineveh. God saved Nineveh. He didn't do what he said. Now he's upset. Now, now it's a plant. What's it going to be next week, he said. Next week, what are you going to send me a WhatsApp about, about what you're upset about next week? The Bible says, God says to him, you haven't labored. You didn't even make this thing grow. I made it grow is what God is saying. I labored. You are just a vessel. You forget all you are is a vessel. I don't care if you've been here 15 years, Myron. All you are is a vessel. I'll take you out tonight if I need to. I don't care if Lazarus Israel has been here before you were born. Before you were formed in the womb. Lazarus was here. If God wants, he can take him home tonight. Are you listening, Harbourites? Don't think that it is because of your existence. God is saying, ah, you act like you grew this plant. You didn't even know you needed the plant. You needed a shelter. You built the shelter. I knew that what you did was not sufficient. I need you to know you can do whatever you want. Whatever you do is never going to be enough. God is showing you a picture. You can go and save. You can go take the best insurance policies. You can go and take the, buy the best car. Tomorrow, God will wipe the car out. And here God is saying to him, and you pretend like it's you? I know it grew on you. I know it grew upon you. I know it came upon you. And you know, many people are confused about what has come upon them as though it's because of their existence. Verse number 11. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much livestock? You know what's the saddest thing for me? The whole book concludes with a question again. And you know what the question is this time? After God asked the question about the tree, about the plant, he moves from the plant to people. I want you to know the things that are falling apart in your life, they're falling apart in your life because God wants to teach you about how you relate to people. You see, stop crying about the business going under. Start crying about the people that you've taken down. Or you've prayed go down. Or you've watched and you said, I hope they flop. Flop, flop, flop. Go down. Fail. This is Jonah. God's teaching a lesson. By destroying the stuff that has grown as a result of you working first and God now working on what you've worked on, 
Remember, Jonah built the shelter first. And then God came upon that shelter with this God that grew. But here's what I'm saying to you. Okay, be careful. Because here's the problem. You are taking more care of things that will die than the people in your life. As much as I want to take care of these pews, and I want them to look good, I would rather these pews fall to the ground because it's packed with people. As much as I love my car, and I take care of it, I would rather that car burns tonight than me driving a fancy car, but my son doesn't want to talk to me. As much as I've worked hard to buy the lounge set, the dining room set, as much as I've worked hard to buy the big screen, big wide, nice wide, as much as that's all nice, I have a lot of people who are stuck with shelters and trees, but no people. He who wins souls is, not who he who wins the lotto is wise. Not he who got one, uh, see what, uh, like a smarties box, what a lot I got. No. Huh. I want you to know we've worked so hard to get all these things. But you die and it stays here. The only thing you take to heaven is souls you've won. The Bible says this, right? I love the question God asked. He said to him, should I not put in Nineveh that great? It's Nineveh is a great city. It was great before Jonah got there. It's still great now after the revival. And it remains great even after God starts judging Jonah. Don't confuse greatness and God. In which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between the... Now, now all of a sudden, I'm, I'm confused. Because the Bible says it's a great city. And great cities are formed with great people. But now the great people are but shambies. They can't discern right hand from left hand. You ask them, which is the right hand? I don't know. I don't know. But they got answers for greatness. They got answers to become great, but they can't. Ask them which is, they, they need discern, and even the discernment they got is not enough. I don't discern which is, have you ever discerned? I don't know now, let me see, wait, wait, wait. Myron asked me, which is my right hand? Lord, just bless me with the spirit of discernment. I, I don't, uh, Lord, help me, uh, which is right, Lord? Which is right, Lord? Which is, which one? Which one? I, I don't know, this one, this one, right hand. Tell me that's not the church today. We are great. We drive great cars. We live in great homes, we wear great clothes, and we come to a great church. But we don't know right from left. You, 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 you don't know? But watch this. Even those who can't have enough discernment to judge right hand from left hand can repent when God speaks. But the man of God who has more discernment cannot repent. The man of God has so much of discernment that when God spoke to him in his city before he left home, he knew God was going to change his mind. That's how the discernment flows in his life. Even when God is speaking, he knows God will change his mind. This man has discernment. And he changes and goes and preaches. He's anointed. Because he brings down a revival in Nineveh. But even in Nineveh that can't discern right from wrong repents. But we got people in the kingdom that know right from wrong. They know right from left. But they won't repent. The book of Jonah is closed without repentance from the man of God. And it is the most ungodliest thing I've ever seen in my life. But you know what's worse? As a pastor that has been preaching now for 15 years, I see people that are willing, even though they can see, they discern. They're so stubborn 
in their anger that a book will close on their lives. In anger. Everybody wants to talk about Job. The book of Job has a man that comes to a place where God doubles him and then the book closes. But do you know, for every Job, there are about 2,000 to 5,000 Jonas where the book of God closes. They never get to Job. This morning I came to ask you a question. I said all of that. I've been preaching for six straight weeks on this subject to get to a place where I ask you, are you too big to repent? Have you arrived in a place now where God will destroy everything that is in your life and you still won't repent? Steady. Steady on. Calm down. Steady. Steady on. When are you going to see that it's you that needs to change? You can change a nation. You can change a whole city of 120,000 great people. But you never change. I told you last week it's been, it'll be a year at the end of this month. It'll be a full year at the end of this month since... Every Sunday, people just come and lay at the altar to say to the Lord, Lord, that's me. Change me. We're not talking about you getting more anointing in your life. That's not what this morning's sermon is about. We're not talking about you getting more growth in your life. That's not what this morning's sermon is about. This morning's sermon is about people of God that are anointed, that are saying, Lord, I want to repent. I don't want to get to a place where I'm above repentance.